A judge pauses a recall against a key Democrat who isn't even representing his district yet. Don't look now, but it appears Coloradans have growing faith in our election process. Colorado researchers outline the chances that COVID will be more of an issue again come winter. Denver is considering a tax on landlords who tell us, eh, they'll just make renters pay it. And that's just business. <laughs> and this is just the news on Next. Whether Colorado Democrats will keep having their way in the state legislature or whether Republicans will finally be able to stop some bills they don't like could come down to a single race. A race that's not even on the November ballot. It's the district in the Brighton area where State Senator Kevin Priola switched his party recently from Republican to Democrat. The district where Republicans are trying to recall him. And a judge just said, not so fast. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. When State Senator Kevin Priola was elected as a Republican, he represented Senate District 25, Brighton, Commerce City, Thornton, Lock Bowie, and Strasburg. He's now a Democrat and still represents that district until January when redistricting moves him to Senate District 13. Still Brighton, also Evans, Greeley, and Fort Lupton. We're at 15,000 signatures already. Uh, we need 18, a little over 18,000 valid signatures. Michael Fields, whose group is funding an effort to recall Priola, told me they'll continue to collect signatures from Senate District 13, even though a Denver judge just ruled that because Priola is not really their state senator yet, he cannot be recalled from that district. We think that we could be successful at appeal, and so that's why we're continuing to get signatures. It's a matter of time and space. Time. Right now, Priola represents people who live on both sides of 160th Avenue here in Adams County until January when the people who live just south of this fence will live in a new district, while the people who live north of 160th Avenue will still be represented by Priola. It seems a bit of a gray area. It's much more clear when running for office. Take, for example, the state's newest 8th Congressional District. It really does not exist yet because the election has not happened and the winner has not been sworn in. Gathering signatures in a district that's not active yet happens all the time. Uh, the 8th Congressional District is not uh, active yet, but you got signatures to get on the ballot in order to do it. If the judge's ruling holds, Fields' group would have to start collecting signatures fresh in January, assuming they still want to recall Priola, who would have two years remaining. I think we will decide that later on, uh, given the fact, is it worth uh, the, you know, one session versus two sessions and what the makeup of the legislature is. The makeup of the legislature. There's the rub. If after the election, the Democrats hold the Senate 1817, you know they're going to go after Priola. But what if it's 1916? And if they get enough signatures, I would say, Kyle, we know this, there's a high likelihood that Priola might resign, even yeah. though he's got two years, to save the seat and allow a vacancy committee to give it to a different Democrat. Just because you try to recall someone, they can always bail before the election and save the seat. He could, yeah, he could duck out and let his new party keep the seat. There's the other question of whether Democrats would really be all that enthused about spending a lot of time, money, and effort to defend this guy, because he's pretty middle of the road. He's not really where the Colorado Democratic Party is today, you know? What's interesting is this lawsuit that the judge ruled on was brought by a Democrat in his current district saying, wait a minute, I would be harmed if a different district gets to try to recall him, knowing full well this Democrat in the current district has no desire to recall Priola. Hey, while you're here, we have been reporting on, on a mistake by Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold's office mm -hmm. where 30,000 mailers went out to non-citizens, people who should not be voting, mailers telling them, go register to vote. Uh, you got a hold of a copy of the correction that went out, what, today? And you noticed something about this. Well, it's interesting. I mean, they're, they're making it right, making sure that, like, everybody knows what's going on. Here's, I want to show you the original mailer, which we've talked about, which it listed the requirements to vote in English and Spanish. And the new mailer lists the requirements again, but the Secretary of State's office made a noticeable change. Just watch the bottom left of the screen. That's the original one that went out. There's the replacement. What's different? It doesn't have Secretary of State Jenna Griswold's name on it. Wait, like her little seal thing and her name is gone? Yeah, the name and office are gone. <laughs> they sent it out. Again, it's a proper update. Yeah, yeah. But the noticeable difference is the mistake happened. It had her name on it. The replacement of a mistake didn't have her name on it. I, that's a clear decision. Maybe I don't, it looked like there was the same amount of room you could have in there. Yeah, I mean, she <laughs> figuratively took her fingerprints off of the error when sending out the correction. That's nearly as funny as when the governor put his name and signature in the letter with everybody's taxpayer bill of rights refunds. That's good stuff. Thank you, Marshall. So despite that recent bumble by the Secretary of State's office, there is encouraging news to report to you for everybody at least who is a fan of the truth because a new poll out today shows a strong majority of Coloradans trust the election process, and that includes now 
a majority of Colorado Republicans surveyed. And that suggests some changing attitudes about elections in our state. A new poll from Maris found 73% of those surveyed were confident or very confident their state or local government will run a fair and accurate election come November. Democrats were more likely to trust elections, but 59% of Republicans surveyed said that they were confident in elections. Now, different polls are never apples to apples, but 73% confidence is a step up from the 68% of respondents who told CU pollsters this time last year that they had confidence in elections. And 59% confidence from Colorado Republicans, that is a really sizable shift from last year's CU poll that had Republican confidence in elections at 45%. So that new Marist poll that was out this morning also looked at the governor and Senate races, found Democratic Senator Michael Bennett up seven points on Republican Joe Day and Democratic Governor Jared, uh, Jared Polis up 18 points on Republican Heidi Ganahl. The last election result that lopsided in a race for governor 20 years ago when Republican Governor Bill Owens defeated Democrat Raleigh Heath. Hey, we are days away from our first debate of this election season. Our unprecedented six debate series starts this Thursday with the only televised debate in Colorado's most closely contested House District. Democrat Yadira Caraveo and Republican Barbara Kirkmeyer running to represent the new 8th Congressional District in Adams and Weld Counties. They will debate here Thursday night at 6.30, right after next. The candidates in all of Colorado's major races will be debating here this month, with the exception of Republican gubernatorial candidate Heidi Ganahl, who declined. Denver voters are being asked to approve a new tax on landlords, $75 per unit per year. It would pay for a legal defense fund for people facing eviction. A landlord group was real clear to our Steve Steger today, if they get taxed, they're passing it right on to renters. The process is really opaque and people don't know their rights. Eviction is one of those things that can follow someone for the rest of their lives and can often be a first step toward a problem Denver knows too well. Eviction is this huge precursor of homelessness in a lot of cases. Ren Echo um, is with No that Eviction that Without that Representation, that the group supporting Initiative 305 on Denver's November ballot. It would tax landlords to create a fund to provide anyone facing eviction legal representation. It's funded by a $75 yearly tax paid out by landlords that would fuel this program to provide legal representation to all tenants facing eviction. The way that this works right now is it's treated essentially as an automatic process, right? Less than 1% of tenants have legal representation. Our analysis of eviction data shows more than 5,000 cases have been filed in Denver courts since the beginning of the year, marking a return to pre-pandemic levels. We should be focusing on real solutions like the lack of supply, um, even rental assistance, we believe would be more effective in this case. No surprise here, the Apartment Association of Metro Denver, which represents landlords, is opposed to this new tax. It's bad policy for the government to use taxpayer funds to pay private citizens to sue each other in civil court. They say it will only add more costs for financially struggling tenants in an era of inflation. A housing provider's revenue comes from rent, and so when you increase fees or taxes, that all gets passed to the consumer. The $75 per unit um, paid by landlords will end up being paid by residents, unfortunately. And that's just business. <laughs> Echo doesn't believe that will always be the case. And even if the cost does get passed on, it would increase their rent by $6, right? Which in my case is less than 1% of my current rent. This is sort of the same rights that we already afford to people accused of a crime, right? And so people are sort of like, wow, why don't we already have that? So the Apartment Association argues that this would be like requiring medical malpractice insurance for doctors, which drove up the cost of health care. But there are other cities who've instituted similar programs, like New York City. 86% of people who were represented by lawyers provided by a similar program there, Kyle, stayed in their home. 86% stayed. Obviously, Denver's different than New York in terms of tenant protections. And I guess the goal wouldn't always be to keep somebody in their home, but just get them some legal help through the process. The thought is if you have a lawyer, you might be able to settle something in court, which may not keep you inside that home, but at least it might keep an eviction off your record, which means it would make it a whole lot easier to find somewhere else to live. Steve, thank you. Teachers tell us they feel like they're losing the control of their classrooms. So for us, it's, it's more of an undercurrent. It's that, you know, we're, we're the villains. Why they feel caught in the middle 
teachers, parents, school boards fight over what's being taught. And predicting COVID-19 trends is still tricky business, even for public health experts. What researchers in Colorado are saying about potential new variants for the holiday season. Next. The staffing shortage in Colorado's schools really revved up during the pandemic and hasn't slowed down since. There are more and more teachers considering leaving the profession altogether. Colorado Education Association, union that represents nearly 40,000 teachers, did a member survey this year. And two-thirds of members, 67%, said they were considering leaving teaching. Top issue was pay. 22% also said they're struggling to feel like they're retaining their classroom autonomy as parent groups and school boards get more and more involved in their direct teaching. We're given a framework of here are the expectations that our kids are supposed to know and be able to do, and it's our job to get them there. What are we supposed to teach? There's these laws saying we're supposed to do this, and then there's <laughs> the state board saying maybe we're not supposed to do this, so we're not even getting clear guidance on what the expectation is. The State Board of Education will vote later this year on whether or not to remove references to the sexuality of various American figures from some elementary school curriculums. And last week, school board meeting down in El Paso County drew protests from parents and teachers after the Academy District 20 school board president encouraged parents to go and raise concerns about content they don't like. If you see objectionable material, go to the teacher or librarian, or better yet, take several others with you who are like-minded if you don't get a satisfactory answer, then go to the principal, superintendent, or bring it to our attention on the Board of Education. Several parents and teachers actually called for the school board president's resignation for saying that. There's a parent group, Advocates for D20 Kids, said the parents should be doing just that, having input on their kids' education. You'll hear that sentiment echoed by a number of parental rights groups across the state. For the past two years, public health experts have warned that COVID cases are likely to surge again each fall and winter. Researchers in Colorado hope that this year might break that trend. The team of the Colorado School of Public Health says that we may be on the right track, but it's still too early to tell for sure. Prevalence of infection is uh, declining slowly, but still relatively high. Uh, so according to wastewater, we're still around the 50th percentile. If nothing changes, uh, then we're on a downward trajectory and can expect that um, at least for the next month or two. Certainly sounds like good news, right? Researchers say if everything stays the same, then cases and hospitalizations could decline through the end of the year. Wastewater, wastewater testing suggests that infection rates are either stable or declining across the state at the moment. The latest models don't take into the possibility that new COVID variants could be coming into the system. While a new variant is not widespread in our state at this point, there are at least two variants being monitored across the country. If a new variant takes hold over the next month or so, researchers say infection rates and hospitalizations would likely take a turn for the worse. Watching the clouds streaming in as well as that cold front you can kind of see from our vantage point around Cheeseman Park overlooking downtown and off to the west those dark skies in place earlier this afternoon with all the sunshine we were able to make it up to the upper 70s 80s off to the eastern plains but now as that cold front is swinging through it's dropping off these temperatures dramatically already in Fort Collins and Greeley you kind of see it on HG Doppler 9 a couple of isolated showers out there as that cold front starts to sink to the south it'll be in the Denver area within the next hour or so you probably already felt the winds out there 35 40 mile per hour wind gusts across northern Colorado and those higher mountain passes looking at 40 to 50 mile per hour speeds tomorrow evening once again will be clipped by another quick little cold front that's going to keep the winds going as well as bring us another little cool off on Thursday tomorrow still not bad with daytime highs in the lower 70s some spots in the 60s off to the northeastern plains 50s and 60s way up high there's that quick little cool off on Thursday day but we bounce back Friday mid 70s looking good a series of cold fronts however arrive for the weekend cooling us into the 60s and bringing us a few more clouds it's an invitation to get artistic it could be anything it could be trash it could be you know you want to sew something on your clothes you want to draw on your shoes they just want people to experience the joy of creating art even at home next We profile all kinds of artists on Next. Of course, any one of us can be an artist if we just choose to create something. Aurora is specifically asking its citizens to get creative from the comfort of home. 
They're calling it October. October is an amazing time of the year. I love October because my kids start school. I love getting creative around the month of October and making spooky things. A puppeteer once told me, just walk down the fruit section and you will be inspired to make little monsters. My name is Bliss Coleman. I'm the executive director of the Aurora Cultural Arts District. If I had a drug of choice, it would be art. And we have launched Arttober. And I was like, oh yes, I'm totally doing that. Arttober is a way for artists to expand their practice based off of what they're already doing and it's open to all mediums and it's a daily exercise. Well the first one I like because I don't normally draw toads. I actually designed the toad to be big and I gave them button eyes so I can actually sew them into a purse later. So whether you're a sculpture artist or you're an illustrator, it's a fun way to expand on your current practice by using prompts. Let's see. Bats, insects. Creepy was number four, which that's super easy. The feather one was actually a bit harder because I didn't know what to draw like with the feather, so it just ended up being the feather. That's always my favorite part, actually, is to see how each individual or artist chooses to interpret a prompt. Like plague is a good one. The clock, I thought of the owl because I think I was watching Hocus Pocus, actually. I hope that, if anything, people take the freedom and the creativity out of it and realize that there's no rules and restrictions. You're still producing something, and that's all we can ask for. Don't stay in your box. Just try it. <laughs> your feedback tonight comes in the form of a question. Whether a Coloradans vote counts if they die before Election Day. Morbid, but a good question. The answer next. Feedback from Ted in Arvada, who says, with Colorado's mail-in voting system, or any state with mail-in voting, what happens when a legally registered voter submits a ballot but then passes away before Election Day? So, Ted, according to a National Legislative Council, 17 states say no. If the vote's challenged, you don't count it. Ten states say yes, you do count it. Colorado law doesn't say. But in 2016, Associated Press reports there were 15 to 20 of those cases, and the state chose to count the votes. So please, vote but then hang on. See you next time.